Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going, and I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1%. A real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Chris Taylor. Uh, he's called The Financial Prepper. So we're going to talk about his YouTube channel and his videos and content and, and all that stuff. So, Chris, thank you for coming. Hi, uh, I'm just glad to be here, Richard. Yeah. Ho hopefully we can help wake some people up. I think so. Tell me a bit about your, your history first. How did you even start thinking about, you know, prepping in any of its forms? You know, what, what was life like for you before you started on this journey? Well, it really goes back to, I learned how, I guess it starts with uh, physically. I got physically fit and then uh, it kind of, and then I wanted to do something else. So I, I got into rental properties and after I got into rental properties, I learned, uh, I didn't want to trade my time for money anymore. So I started investing. And when you start investing, you start learning from really intelligent people. Just try, try to seek those guys out, you know, see what they're into, what they're doing. And you start learning that the wealthy people are, are bracing for impact. You know, they're, you know, you've got people like Michael Burry and Jamie Dimon and, and just incredible, super smart people are saying, Hey, we're fixing to enter a depression. And you start researching and, 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 and there's no way around it. The food shortages every day. So I started a YouTube channel, started covering food shortages, started covering food plants burning down. You know, we're over 60 food plants this year that have caught fire. Yeah. What's, what's no, the typical number, by the way? I would say it's, it's about four or five times what it should be. So I'm not right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's no real number. It's just very, very odd how that would, there's just too many things. There's too many things with, along with ESG and, and our, our president cutting off oil and all these strange, we're running out of, out of diesel oil. Have you heard that one? I just did a story on that. We're running out of the additives. Yes. Yeah. Uh, diesel goes, exhaust fluid, right. That not, allows trucks to run. Otherwise it becomes bricked. No, not the exhaust fluid. We're running out of that too. Oh. The oil, the actual oil. 
that goes in the truck. That's insane. We have the oil, but we do not have all the additives that go into it that that makes it work. There's only two places that that make those additives, and they're just out of they're out of it. And they're saying it's four to eight weeks they're going to be out. But you know, I hate to put a timestamp on anything. It seems like I'm always early. But that's kind of how I kind of started waking up, and and there's just no way not to sit. If you if people open their eyes up and pull their head out of the sand, they'll be able to see. Wow, this this isn't you know, doom and gloom or fear mongering, this is really going to happen. And there's going to be a lot of people that suffer and mainly the people overseas. I think it's going to be disgusting to watch what happens to them. Uh, but, yeah. I've heard that there's going to be um, death from starvation uh, by hundreds of millions of people. I don't know what the exact estimates are, but it looks like hundreds of millions, maybe even up to a billion, which is crazy. I mean, that many people, it's terrible. Yeah, and they, everybody wants to blame it on Russia, and uh, you know that is the bread. Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. I get that, but there was already problems before that. There was food shortages before that ever started. So, what do you <laughs> yeah. think? Um, you know, like I don't know everyone like says, "Oh, it's a conspiracy theory, that kind of stuff." But I'm not going to say that to you. What What are you seeing, and where do you think this is coming from? What's your honest assessment? Well, of I, you know, the conspiracy theory thing, I get that a lot. And usually I'm reading straight off the World Economic Forum. I'm reading facts and quotes from the people that are in charge. And it's like, I don't see how this can be a conspiracy. <laughs> they're telling you exactly what they're doing. By 2030, you'll own nothing and be happy. This is not me saying it. That's the people that are in charge that meet, that have all the money, that have, you know, all the wealth. It's them saying it, not me. I'm just telling you what they're saying. So there's going to be a time where we're right, just like, you know, the food shortages, the, the crop failures that, you know, we've been, I've been calling this stuff for six months or, or longer and now it's starting to show up and it, and then nobody likes to talk about it. You know, just like the mandated medicine that I wasn't crazy about, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, anyway, uh, what was the other question? Well, I want to ask you, so what, um, well, we'll get into the details shortly, but so you're, you're actually starting to see the things that you prognosticated six plus months ago. You're actually starting to see, at least localized food shortages. And, and tell me, tell listeners a bit about what you're literally seeing right now, you know, end of June, 2022, which is when we're okay, recording. Okay, so I have uh, my co- people in my comment section. They're, I've got a telegram, a financial prepper telegram, and I do call outs about two or three times a week. It's kind of like a boots on the ground or community, uh, helpful community call outs pretty much is I, I name it something different i don't know if i'm gonna name it just yet but you can get i'll read through there and say hey we're, there's no oil in florida hey there's uh we don't have any food here there's no baby aspirin in canada this lady looked all over the place couldn't find any baby aspirin the, the medical supplies are really running thin in a lot of different places it's not centralized it's not like it's you know there's a glut of goods right now that's what's so strange because nothing goes straight up and nothing goes straight down so the supply chain is starting to get tight again, and now we've got these glut of goods, and there's actually a surplus at stores like Target and, and places like that of mainly the goods we don't need. Uh, but if if you can buy, I, I'm trying to encourage people right now to, you know, if you're not a prepper, you're just kind of getting into it, you're starting to realize, hey, you know, food prices are only going up. You know, that's that's one thing that we've been trying to tell people. You can beat the stock market if you'll buy food that you're going to eat anyway, you'll beat the stock market. And it's so far. Oh, so it's really instead true. of, uh, yeah, instead of buying Bitcoin, you should buy food coin, you know, AKA well, food. Cause it's going to go up. Well, I'm big. I like Bitcoin too. I mean, I think I'm just it's, just, it's speculation, but yeah, you're right. That's I, a lot of times I say, um, try to bring stuff to reality. Like one laying hen, I've got chickens and a lot of people want to have chickens, but they can't or whatever. They're not ready. I think that one ounce of silver, one silver round will be worth one laying hen. I think that's how, and I'm sure the ratio will get a little bit off, but right now it's pretty close as our currency, as they devaluate our currency and food becomes more scarce. Like, like if you go back to Venezuela, that's the closest thing we have as of late, you know, the hyperinflation that happened there. And yes, they were different. They're, they weren't the world reserve currency. They didn't have a bond market. They didn't have a tax revenue, but. It was funny. Eggs went up 15,000 X, not percent. Eggs went up 15,000 times the original price. Apples went up 6,587 X. 
potatoes went up 2000. I mean, and the only thing that rivaled food was gold. Gold went up 25,000 eggs. So, and so like in 2017, gold was 11,500 in 2018, it was worth 3 million. So that you were able to really hedge against that with physical precious metals and also eggs and food because food was a real, uh, a, a real problem. So that's, I, I think well, that's exactly um, what we're getting into. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Let's baby step people. So if someone today is listening and they want to prepare somewhat, somehow, and you know, they're, they're just not used to any of this. You know, they've been living a, a, a life with, of convenience like we all have. What, what are some of the first things they can do to start preparing? Like what's level one in your eyes? I would get, I would go to the store and get some rice. I would, carbohydrates are pretty available right now. Rice and oatmeal and stuff like that. I eat oatmeal every day, I eat rice just about every day. So I would secure some of those items and I usually use a vacuum sealer. And I'll, I'll get the 25 pound bag of rice, which isn't very much. And it'll feed you for a while, carbohydrates. And you can dump it in your vacuum bag, suck the air out, and put it in your cabinet. Put it in your pantry. Start slowly filling your pantry up with food that you're going to eat anyway. Because it's food is only going to go up. So if you can try to start small. So like the people in China. You know, they locked the people in China down. And they they started literally starving in about two weeks. Three weeks that they really started. I mean, they were screaming and hollering out the windows. And if they'd have just had a little bit of food on hand, you know, they, they probably could have made it through that. So like canned goods, that's a simple one. You know, canned goods, rice, oatmeal. There's all kinds of uh, channels. Uh, I watched one the other day, American Prepper Girl. Uh, she she bought 60,000 calories for under $100. And they weren't the best calories, but, you know, that's something that would get you through until you could get in a better place. Eggs. If you could get some powdered eggs, protein's going to be really hard to find. Uh, you know, protein's usually expensive. Meat, uh, you know, even protein grains with protein is more expensive. Powdered eggs are they're really hard to find right now. If you can get some chickens, I've got videos on, on how to do it. It's really not hard, and most people like it after they get into it. And they're just out there crapping out omelet, you know, they're, but like you said, though, to baby steps, a lot of people are in apartments. Um, I would say canned goods, you know, beans, rice, oatmeal, vacuum seal them up and start eating them. Eat, eat off the front. And every time you go to the store, replace it on the back. It's like you have your grocery store at your house. That's a really good place to start and get some way. If you don't have water, it's hard for me to think about water because I'm in Louisiana and I've got water everywhere. I could just walk about anywhere and scoop up some water and boil it and be okay. But a lot of people have trouble with water insecurity and with the drought going on, I can only imagine. So, you know, well, even let's if go, um, before we, we, we go through all this stuff, can we, I just want to go step by step. Sure. Yeah. Protein, you know, yes, you can buy it. I know some situations where people could buy like an eighth of a cow or a half a cow and they could store it in their freezers for quite a long time. But where, I mean, can people keep chickens and raise them to eat? Or is it really just the eggs? Can people keep ducks? Um, or are there any animals that people could keep to eat, you know, for protein? Or is that a, a very difficult thing to do? Okay. Uh, small scale, just getting started. Rabbits. Rabbits. You can get uh, a few rabbits and it'll just about feed you protein uh, for a long, forever, I guess. They'll procreate and mm. you can... You can really get along with the rabbits. Meat chickens. I don't have meat chickens because there's never a good time to go pluck a chicken. But, um, you know, I just use it for the eggs because eggs is a really good protein and, and mm. fat together. 
It's a renewable resource. It's green energy. I'm just kidding. Sure. It's the, and actually, actually really is green energy. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. That's it, man. And the fertilizer works so good in the garden. You know, it's it's. It, I just don't see any downside to it, other than a lot of people don't have the room, and you know they don't have a lot of people don't have time to do chickens. I, I mean, I understand that, but rabbits laying chickens would be my. I don't have rabbits. I I really can't just have any more chores at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so rabbits could be but, viable. Chickens, at least for their eggs, could be viable. But, but really, hang on, really, I would say building a relationship with a local farmer. I think that would be the most, uh, that would be probably the best thing for most people to do. But you need to start those relationships now, you know. Uh, yeah, you know what, I, I just thought about this last night with food and, for, well, with fertilizer shortages and other shortages. Actually, probably the small farmers that can make their own fertilizer from animals and are, and retain their own water from rain, let's say, they might be the most stable going forward instead of the big, you know, grocery stores and everything. Yeah, we definitely need more small farmers. It's just that fertilizer thing you speak of is a big deal. There's not, I didn't realize the guy that came up with NPK, commercial fertilizer, won a Nobel Prize. That's how we feed the masses. We make it from natural gas, and there's almost a war on that stuff now. You know, it's a yeah, the Haber Bosch process. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's a really good book actually called The Alchemy of Air by Thomas Hager or Hagen, and it talks about you know how the Haber Bosch process came about, and the world was only really able to sustain about a billion people until we learned to make artificial fertilizer. So if we don't have enough, uh, our population is eight billion. That's not good. Yeah, the, they just, uh, the W, let's see, the world, let's see, the world food program, WFP, the UN's WFP just cut Africa's subsidize, uh, the food subsidize for 50%. So it's going to affect three out of every four people and they're already starving, you know, and, and I got into the article a little more and it wasn't, the donations were there. They they're not being able to resource the food to, to actually get to the product. So it's our it's starting now. It's already starting. We're in the descent. I don't know what else to do besides the stuff we're talking about. Well, that's that's why we're talking about. It. I want to give some practical advice. So let you know again. Let's go back to uh, chickens. Can someone start with one chicken? How many chickens do they need to have? enough eggs to, to eat them regularly. You know, what are some of the things you've learned about dealing with chickens? Let's, let's get into a little bit of the details, you know, so people can learn from your experience. Chicken, sure. It's really not that much to it. It's really not like people think. They can live in a small area. I built a big coop that I could walk in. I didn't have to, you know, duck down low or anything. There's several different ways to do it. I would suggest more than one chicken. They get lonely. One chicken will get lonely and probably won't lay very many eggs. If you have a, a chicken's usually good for about an egg a day, not quite an egg a day, but uh, if, if every, I think it's like 280 eggs a year on average or something like that, maybe 260, some hmm. of them are 300. So, you know, if you want, and if you've got six chickens, having a dozen is really not that much bigger of a deal. Okay. And they, they put their self up at night, you know, it's uh, you got to make sure mm-hmm. their coop's clean. That's a big one. Making sure the coop's clean. We, we've never had a sick chicken, maybe one time, and ivermectin knocked it out. That stuff's really good. But yeah. let's see, chickens. Uh, what? What? Could, I don't know what I could tell you. I've got videos on it. Well, just you know, like when you when you, how many chickens I mean, did you? What it surprised you about having chickens? Was it easier every, than you thought? Okay, hard you thought? Yeah. Everything's trying to get them. That's the biggest. That's the biggest yeah. problem. Everyone wants to eat them. Everything. Mm-hmm. everything raccoons <laughs> we had a fox get into our chicken house and i put chicken wire around the the coop right well chicken wire is not to keep varmints out it's to keep chickens in a fox ripped a hole in that chicken coop and killed 10 of 14 chickens yeah so don't make that mistake use hardware cloth hardware cloth is a, a much thicker wire and they can't really rip through that chicken wires you wouldn't think they'd rip through it but it, it was nothing for that fox to rip through it and they won't quit killing it until they're just 
tired of doing it, I guess. It, it was devastating. I was at work and my wife was really upset. <laughs> Everything's out to get them and food and water. It's really, they need some laying boxes to lay their eggs in. And I really try to encourage people to do that. It's now, what, what was it like when you had uh, the first few eggs from your chickens? Like, did they taste better, different? Or what was that experience like? The first few eggs? Yeah, yeah the first few good. eggs. Like, did you feel like a rush? Like, I did it, you know, or how did you feel? Yeah, yeah, it's cool to get your first few eggs. It's, you, you'll notice immediately how they cook up so much better. The white's not runny. It gets, gets really thick and fluffy when you're cooking it. The yolk stays together. Uh, my favorite way to eat a fresh egg is poached. When you poach a fresh egg hot out of the chicken's butt, it will stay. It, it's like you're boiling it out of the shell. It's really good. That's, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's strange. Be, having fresh food is really, really, really re- rewarding. It still is. It's still, we covet these eggs. We give them to my mom. She hoards them. They're, they're really good because our chickens eat kale. They eat everything that comes out of the garden. Everything, everything comes out of the kitchen, any kind of scraps, their own shells, you name it. Oh, really? They can eat all that stuff? They, you throw it out there and they will eat it. And they, it's cool. like, they're like composting egg factories. It's really, <laughs> That's very cool. You said that an average chicken, if kept well, will lay about what, two, was it right? 280 eggs a year? Well, there's ch- every chicken's different, every breed, but I want to say it was unusual to get over 300 and i would say over 250 is pretty much normal wow that's crazy do you um do you know any of the laws surrounding um like selling the eggs that you would create or are there like food co-ops or people that do this and then share like one has a chicken one has a goat one has a you know one grows vegetables etc do you see any swaps between people yes we're starting to see more of that i got some people in california that are swapping their eggs for honey they're swapping you know they're uh they're bartering with their eggs already i got a good buddy of mine that's bartering guns for gold and silver he does that all the time but you know right now we're not doing any of that we're just giving them we're give we give to a couple of families that uh that don't have much and we give to my parents and you know i eat the rest of them we've got 20 23 chickens i think we just we just hatched we just incubated 21 more wow Uh, yeah, but half of them will be roosters, and some of the chickens we got are three or four years old, so they're, you know, they're about to slow down. They're only good for so many eggs. And oh, how long will a chicken last until it's uh, it's pooped out and you have to eat? You know, I don't really know the answer to that. I want to say it's about four years, but it could okay. be longer. I don't really know. Like I said, I'm not really an, a, a chicken. Uh, we do it, but I don't want to pretend like I'm the the end all be all know it all of the subject right right gotcha well tell me what else you're doing that you know the comments you gave already are very useful i think to people that don't know okay good yeah Yeah. included yeah so tell me about some of the other major things you're doing too okay so uh, there's a lot of people that you know what can we do right now i get i get that question a lot and if you'll think about growing your food and i know you probably won't be able to grow enough food to feed you and your family I mean, I get that. That's hard to do, but you can grow enough t- food to subsidize your diet. You know, you can like me and my wife just got through harvesting potatoes this morning. And I've been telling people it is so easy to grow potatoes and potatoes is a, it is packed full of energy. I mean, there's, so you, you could, you could grow a row of tomatoes and it's like a, it's like water. I mean, you're getting very little nutrition and calories from a tomato. So you can grow tomatoes and they taste good, but they're mostly water and the nutrition isn't really there. You know, it's not like a potato that's packed full of energy. I mean, you can get a lot of miles, you know, think how far you can go on a, eating five potatoes versus five tomatoes. So I say that because that is something that most people can do on their porch. You can grow potatoes in a bucket and I mean a bunch of them too. You can grow, uh, you can, there's videos on how to do it in a barrel. You plant them in the bottom of the barrel and they'll sprout and you cover up the potato plant again, leave a little bit, of, leave the head out where it'll keep growing. Every time you cover it up, it'll grow more potatoes. You can literally grow hundreds of pounds of potatoes in a barrel. That's really cool. Yeah. So I always recommend growing potatoes because in, um, I just interviewed a guy 
Arpod from Starpath Academy, he lived through the hyperinflation in Romania. And I asked him, I said, what did you do for food? How, I mean, what do we need to look, look at? He said, we survived on potatoes, lard, and bread. That was their, that was the majority of what they, they ate. So, you know, you can learn a lot from history. And that's why, you know, like I said, anytime in history, eggs was always really up there in price. If you go back to the Weimar Republic in Germany, uh, an egg was like that you just couldn't find them. And if you could, they were too expensive. So that that's why I always lean towards eggs, potatoes, real food that you eat every day. And a lot of people buy buckets of food, uh, you know, freeze dried food from some kind of prepper place. I don't really advise that too much. It's really expensive. And I, I just would never buy anything that I wouldn't eat it every day, you know. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. I'm trying, let's see. Potatoes is a good one. Eggs. And if you've got, okay, so you've got your food, right? You, let's say you're already doing a few of these things. If you're going to hedge your wealth, you know, you don't want to, you know, the, the do, inflation is closer to 20% than it is 10. So that means if you've got $100,000 in the bank, it will effectively buy $80,000 worth of goods and services at the end of this year. So just try to think. If it, if it doesn't get worse. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's it right now. Sure. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think they're fixing to blow the top off of it. I think they're fixing to. Oh, well, for different items, too. Like, you know, a dollar will now only buy, you know, 40 cents a gas, essentially. By the end of this year, it could be a dollar would only buy 10 cents a gas. It's going up so much. You know, gas is, uh, you know, I'm here in Texas. It's gone up. It's more than double from, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So certain things are inflating like insanely. Certain things, not so much, not so much, still meeting 15, 20%, but some things are really off the charts. Yeah. Fuel is, uh, I, I believe that is the death knell to the economy. If we don't get fuel prices down, that is going to, that's what this whole thing runs off of. That is the lifeblood of the economy is diesel fuel. It goes in everything. Every good you get gets delivered powered by diesel fuel and uh if you really want to shut something down you know take the take take the blood from it that's that's exactly what's going on and it's costing me i spent i do uh, natural gas hainesville shell well hookups i've been with a a pipe fabricator for 15 years i'm getting out of it now but it was it cost me a hundred dollars every other day no yes it's two hundred dollars. Yeah, it's two hundred dollars every two days. Yes, a hundred dollars a day to get to work and back. You know how many people can do that? I mean, I can do it because you know I don't owe too many people, and I try to live my life uh, where you know I don't like being in debt. And it's just kind of how I stay, unless it's good debt like rental properties or things that pay me to own them. But most people, most people don't have five hundred dollars in their bank account, in their savings account, and when those people can't get to work. Because fuel prices are so high or they can't buy food because it's so expensive because it took so much diesel to get it here. They had to go up on the price again, not including the inflation that's already happening because, you know, even supply and demand is affecting it as well. That's good. That's the biggest takeaway is that the the diesel fuel is really going to make things worse Uh, on top of the death shortage, on top of the oil. You know, it's, it's just it's so many things it's like it's it's the perfect storm it, it seems planned really do you think it's deliberate or it's just a you know a confederation of fools to keep doing the wrong thing wrong thing and i really hate to talk like that but i just don't see how it's not i can't i can't see you know if you if you want to know what the our government's going to do on the important decisions to make they're going to pick the wrong decision every single time they always pick the wrong one. It's the very opposite of what we should be doing. It makes absolutely no sense, the, the moves they've made, other than collapse the country, make the people hungry, control the food, control the people. Uh, uh, that really sounds doomy, but I just can't see it any other way. If there's another way, let me know. Yeah, no. If there's another way, let them know. We'll see if they yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, so... Uh, Potatoes was a good insight. That's a nutrient-packed food. It sounds like that's pretty easy to grow. Like you said, you can grow them. What else? Are you collecting rainwater or are you just relying on wells or city uh, water? What about I that part of the equation? 
yeah, I've got a well that's it's a really good clean well on my property. I just dug a pond, a two acre pond, which we don't have any rain right now, so it's a big dust bowl. Like, but like I said, water around here is not a big deal. It's going to be a big deal for a lot of people. And if you could get a Berkey style water filter or some kind of life straw or some way to filter water, just in case, you know, because you you can only go about was it three days without water. So well, it depends when you know if it hits you in the middle of summer right now where it's like a hundred degrees. I don't know if you're going to make three days, three hours but, uh, maybe. Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know all about it. So no, so I'm do you not have doing... friends. Uh, anyone that's collecting rainwater or the people that you hang out with, uh, they don't need to. I don't have anybody. Well, that's not true. There's a few people in the, a few of my subscri- subscribers do that, but you know, I, I don't know. It's, I mean, collecting rainwater should be pretty straightforward. If you don't have rainwater, you just find a way to, you know, harvest the water off your house, gutter it into a big tank. And you, gotcha. you can always treat it later, but no, I really don't. My neighbor does it for his chickens, but I, you know, I don't have any, any reason to do okay. that. Well, that's good. It's one less thing you have to worry about, you know? So you said you you know, this morning you were like harvesting potatoes and you dug a, a pond, et cetera. How much time and effort does it take? Again, even we're just talking like level one or level two prepping, however you define it. But, you know, for someone that's really busy right now, or this is so alien to them, they're like, you know, how much time do they need to spend to make some kind of impact for themselves and their family? And that's, that's going to be their conviction. However, you, whatever your convictions are about how bad it's going to get, I would just say, you know, because it costs a lot of money too, not just time, you know, time is one thing and it, you know, it is, it is time to, to maintain 15 acres and chickens and, and I'm not the one digging the pond. I had it, Doug, cause I'm, I'm super busy. I don't, I mean, my wife tends to the chickens for the most part. I have a guy that's mowing my place. You know, I'm, I'm really having to think about my time as my most valuable asset. So I get that completely. Uh, how much well, time is it? If we asked your wife, like, how long does it take for her to administer the chickens every day? How much time do you see her spending? I bet she's got about 30 minutes in a day, maybe an hour on the weekend, possibly, to clean the coop, you know. All, all it is to it is letting them out in the morning and making sure they got water and food and picking up the eggs. There's really not a whole lot to do once once you get set up. It's just, but here's the thing. You're going to pay all that on the front end. You're going to. You know, you're going to have to build the coop and make all the mistakes and do all the, you know, because you're not going to just have a successful, you're going to be like me and a fox is, might get them or something else is going to happen or they get mites or, you know, there's all these things that happen just like gardening. You're not going to grow a perfect garden the first time. So you're going to have to pay the time on the front end to get it set up and automated as possible. That was my goal is to have a garden that I walked through like a grocery store that I didn't have to weed and uh, a chicken coop that has an electric door uh, that's got five gallon buckets worth, full of food that I don't have to fill up once a week. Now I said she does 30 minutes because we, like I told you, we uh, raised those, we hatched those 21 in the incubator. So that is adding a little more time to her. Uh, other than that, other than cleaning the coop once a week, because it is important, it's really not that time consuming. Now, everything else we do, you know, <sighs> You're you're gonna have to figure that out. Grow a small garden, and, and you'll learn how to cut corners and and make it more time efficient. You know, drip tape. We use drip tape in the garden. Everything I do, I try to get as least time involved in it as possible. Pay it on the front end. Get it ready with drip tapes and timers and plastic and you know all that stuff. Cages. It'll take me all weekend to get it set up, but after that, it's on a timer and it's done. I don't have to you know I don't have to mess with it every day like most gardeners do. I got a video on that too. I built an attachment for my tractor that lays the tape, the drip tape and the plastic and heals it up. And it's pretty neat. It's called plastic oh, mulch. Good. Yeah. Well, what, no, what, is probably, what, is, what is this drip tape? How does, how does it work? Just out of curiosity. Drip tape has, is, uh, it goes two inches under the soil and it has little uh, omitters every eight, six, eight or 12 inches. So you turn the water on. Each row has a valve at the end of it that goes into a piece of poly, a little small plastic valve. So I can shut off any row I want to or turn on any row I want to, and it's on a timer. So when the when the timer goes off, it releases the water, and it goes into the manifold, the poly line, then it fills up the drip tape. The drip tape splices inside of that poly line, 
and the drip tape swells up and it, it just starts dripping water. It just omits water all the way down the row at 10, at 10 PSI. So it waters the garden from underneath the plastic mulch. The plastic mulch is just like white plastic, a sheet of white plastic over it, real thin. So the white plastic keeps your moisture under there. It keeps the soil kind of loose for the roots to grow really good. And it also keeps the rain from washing it away, if we ever have that again. But, yeah, no, that's great. Huh. Yeah, it really, it changed my garden. It changed, it was the, it's the difference between me, between me having a successful garden and not, to be honest with you. Oh, wow. Well, it's important I asked you then, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, check that video out. It's, uh, it, it really did change things. Well, let's tell, let's tell listeners how to uh, find out more from you. So what's the name of your, of your YouTube channel and, you know, what can people put in to find your videos? Yeah, uh, just YouTube Financial Prepper. That's it. I'll be the first one to pop up, and you'll see me doing news stories of food shortages. You'll see me doing uh, gold miner stocks because I think when we run out of physical, they're going to go through the next bubble. You, you know, I, I gave warnings out about the stock market when it was at all-time highs, saying how all the wealthy people were selling. <laughs> I smacked the anvil. I got a big anvil. I'm smacking it with a hammer when there's a warning about something that's going to affect all those to try to wake people up. I'll be right there at Financial Prepper. Come check me out. I've got a Telegram channel as well called Financial Prepper. Hmm. And tons of people over there sharing valuable information. The people in the comments are salt of the earth. They're like the best people you've ever met. Get in the comments, and they'll help you any way they can. Okay, excellent. Well, Chris, it was it was really good to speak to you, and I learned a lot of uh, useful things. I think listeners will as well. So thanks for coming on the podcast very, very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Richard. Thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.